Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding PIM. In this presentation, we'll explain the basic technical principles behind PIM, or passive intermodulation, why PIM is an issue in wireless communications, as well as how PIM is tested in the field. To explain what passive intermodulation is, we first have to start by explaining harmonics and intermodulation products. Harmonics are copies of signals that appear at integer multiples of a fundamental frequency. For example, a signal at 100 MHz passing through a nonlinear device produces harmonics at 200 MHz, 300 MHz, 400 MHz, 500 MHz, etc. Note that the amplitude or level of a harmonic decreases as the harmonic order or number increases. In addition to harmonics, nonlinear devices also create something called intermodulation products. Unlike harmonics, which can be created by a single signal, at least two signals are needed for the creation of intermodulation products. When these two signals mix together in a nonlinear device, they produce signals, or products, at the sum and difference frequencies. For example, let's assume we have two signals or tones, one at 250 MHz and one at 450 MHz. When these mix in a nonlinear device, tones at the sum and difference frequencies are produced, here 700 MHz and 200 MHz. Not only will our two fundamental tones, F1 and F2, mix with each other, but they'll also mix with the harmonics, such as 2F1 and 2F2. So we'll have additional intermodulation products at 2F1 plus F2, 2F1 minus F2, 2F2 plus F1, 2F2 minus F1, etc. We often refer to the order of harmonics and intermodulation products. Order refers to the sum of unsigned coefficients. For example, 2F1, the second harmonic of F1, is second order. F1 plus F2 is also second order. The third harmonic of F1, 3F1, is third order. And 2F2 minus F1, or 2F2 plus F1, are also third order products. Let's look at a diagram. The two fundamental or first order tones can create a very large number of harmonics and intermodulation products. Second order products include the two second harmonics, 2F1 and 2F2, as well as the basic sum and difference signals, F2 plus F1 and F2 minus F1. When it comes to third order products, we have the third harmonics of the fundamentals, 3F1 and 3F2, and then have four additional third order products, 2F1 plus F2, 2F2 plus F1, 2F1 minus F2, and 2F2 minus F1. In addition to the third order products, higher order products are also produced, such as fifth order, seventh order, etc. However, the amplitude of these higher order products is considerably lower than the amplitude of the third order products. Note too that all of these odd ordered products are spaced the same distance apart, namely F2 minus F1. One last note about intermodulation products. As the order of intermodulation products increases, the width of the intermodulation products also increases. For example, if the fundamentals are 1 kHz wide, the third order products will be 3 kHz wide, the fifth order products will be 5 kHz wide, etc. Depending on the frequency and spacing of the fundamentals, this widening of the signals may be hard to see, especially for testing using narrowband or CW tones. However, this becomes much more noticeable if the fundamentals are wider, such as cellular signals that may be several megahertz up to tens or even hundreds of megahertz wide. Now that we understand what intermodulation is, let's talk about the difference between active and passive intermodulation. As we mentioned before, intermodulation products are created in nonlinear devices or mixers. These can be either active or powered devices or passive or unpowered devices. As you might expect, active intermodulation occurs by mixing in active devices. An example of this would be something like a tower-mounted amplifier. On the other hand, passive intermodulation, or PIM, is created by mixing in passive devices, the classic example being a rusty bolt. You'll sometimes hear PIM referred to as the rusty bolt effect because corroded metallic junctions are a very common source of PIM. The junction of dissimilar materials or metals is probably the most common source of PIM, and these junctions can be created in various ways. Corrosion or rust is a very common culprit, as are defects in manufacturing or installation. 
Loose or over-tightened connectors are another source of PIM, and even passive components, such as directional couplers, can lead to PIM issues. PIM products are almost always undesired signals. These products can fall into other channels or bands, creating noise, distortion, etc. This in turn can have a strong negative impact on the key performance indications in wireless networks, such as throughput, retainability, or call drops, etc. In particular, the third order intermodulation products are the most troubling, since they both fall close to the fundamental in frequency, and they have greater amplitude than the higher order products. Note, however, that although these higher order products are lower in peak amplitude, they can be very wide, raising the noise floor over broad spectral ranges. This higher noise floor is a more serious problem for the newer generations of cellular, which tend to require a cleaner RF environment and a lower noise floor due to the higher order modulation schemes used. Also, as spectrum becomes more crowded, there's an increased probability of intermodulation products falling onto occupied frequencies. Before we move on to talking about PIM testing, there's an important distinction to make, namely the difference between internal and external PIM. In the case of internal PIM, the source of the PIM is between the transmitter and the antenna. For example, if PIM is being caused by metal flakes inside of the base station cables or connectors, this would be a case of internal PIM. On the other hand, if a rusty fence were creating PIM, this is an external PIM source. Generally speaking, external PIM sources are much harder to physically locate and remedy than internal PIM sources. Although someone experienced in interference hunting and PIM troubleshooting can sometimes recognize a PIM issue by its spectral signature, so to speak, in most cases it's very difficult to detect PIM passively. One good first troubleshooting step when PIM is suspected is to turn off one of the suspected contributing components. Remember that two or more signals are required to create PIM. But this presupposes that you both know and can control, that is, you can turn on and off, at least one of the suspected components, and this frequently is not the case. Therefore, an active PIM test is usually the preferred way of diagnosing, troubleshooting, and resolving PIM issues. A special instrument called a PIM tester is connected to a base station antenna via the transmission line, and two CW tones are injected. The PIM tester knows the frequencies at which third order products would appear, given the frequencies of the two tones it's generating. If PIM is being generated either internally within the system or externally, one or both of the third order products will be detected by the PIM tester. In a standard PIM test, the third order product is used because this product always has the highest amplitude, but keep in mind it's possible for higher order products to cause interference and other issues as well. Most commercial PIM testers have a transmit power in the range of tens of watts per tone, with both tones transmitted at the same power level. There are two main reasons for using relatively high power levels in PIM testing. The first is that we need to simulate power that's close to the actual transmitter power, and modern cellular base stations usually have transmit powers in the tens of watts. We also need to be able to see any generated intermodulation products in the presence of interference or a high noise floor and more power in the fundamentals means more power in the products. With regards to the measured products, we can express the results either as the absolute power in dBm or relative to the fundamental, that is in dBc, or decibels down from the carrier. This is the most common way that PIM results are represented. Typical measured PIM levels in the field are about minus 150 dBc. This means that if our PIM tester is generating 30 to 40 watts, measured PIM levels will be around minus 105 dBm. Our PIM test can tell us that PIM is occurring, but in order to resolve PIM, we also need to know where the PIM is being generated. Some PIM testers can provide something called distance to PIM, or a rough estimate of how far away the PIM source is. This is useful in both finding so-called internal PIM, as well as finding external PIM sources. However, Distance to PIM measurements only give the approximate distance, that is, the location of the source on a circle or sphere, not the exact location where PIM is being created. So how do we find the specific source of PIM? There are several different approaches to localizing a PIM source. The brute force method of determining a source of PIM is simply replacing parts to see if the PIM goes away. If the PIM is believed to be internal, then visual inspection or tapping on connectors and components can help to determine if that component is involved. 
If measured PIM levels change when an object is manually manipulated, then it's likely that object is involved in the production of PIM. For external sources of PIM, a so-called PIM blanket is sometimes used. This is an RF insulating blanket that can be used to cover suspected sources of PIM. For example, if the measured PIM product disappears or drops in amplitude when a rooftop air vent is covered with a PIM blanket, that vent is a likely source of PIM. Another method is using a portable spectrum analyzer or monitoring receiver and a near-field probe or directional antenna. This technique is very similar to how active non-PIM RF interferers are located, the interferer in this case being the third-order product created while our PIM test is active. And like most other interference issues, finding and resolving PIM can be very labor-intensive and time-consuming, so using the proper tools and techniques is crucial in efficient and effective resolutions of PIM issues. In many cases, a hybrid approach that combines multiple methodologies is highly advisable. In summary, intermodulation is the mixing of two or more signals in a nonlinear device, and this creates both harmonics and products of varying orders. When this mixing occurs in passive, that is, unpowered devices, we refer to this process as passive intermodulation, or PIM. Unintended or undesired intermodulation products are a problem because they can create noise and interference, and this is a particularly common issue in cellular networks. The third order intermodulation product, being the strongest, is the most troublesome, but higher order products are also capable of creating issues, including an overall increase in the ambient noise floor. PIM testing is the active process by which we detect and locate PIM sources, and is usually performed using two high power, unmodulated RF signals, or tones. The PIM tester transmits these two tones into the cable and antenna system, and then checks to see if a third order product appears at the mathematically predicted frequency. If PIM is detected, there are multiple methods of locating and resolving PIM. Classic methods include distance to PIM, which gives us a rough distance to the PIM source, as well as physical manipulation of components or devices to see if PIM levels change during manual manipulation. And finally, portable spectrum analyzers or receivers and directional antennas or probes can be used to hunt for PIM sources in the same way that active RF interferers are detected and located. This concludes our presentation, Understanding PIM. Thanks for watching.